As we greet everyone with the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ and I thank God for what God is doing in our midst. Because prayer must be a powerful weapon in the hands of a believer. And that's why Jesus said in Luke 18 verse 1 that you ought to pray at all times. Hallelujah! Not at some times, not when your mood is good or when you are high in the spirit, then I pray and when you are down, I don't pray. My brother and sister, because we have to pray at all times because the enemy is behind us. He is behind the church. Because you know why? The church has been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. He is behind you. Every day we have battles in our lives. Every day I can say challenges are there. I am telling you today because the enemy is not asleep. Because Bible says that. I am not telling. You want me to show what the Bible says? It clearly says, uh, if you look into the Bible of uh, Matthew chapter 13, Verse 24, see about the parable Jesus Christ was saying. You see clearly in the, hallelujah, verse 24, not 21. Another bar put the forth and said, the kingdom of heaven is like a man which sowed good seed in the field. But while men slept, the enemy came. Men slept. Church slept. Is that when the enemy is at work. It's not when a man or a woman is on the knees of the enemy that work. He cannot come at that time. That's why you must be a man or a woman of prayer. Because every battle you win, you win on your knees. I'm telling you today, Jesus Christ was the person who was tempted the most. But he prayed a lot. A lot you look at the life of Jesus Christ. He prayed whenever he got time. But whenever we get time, we don't have time for prayer. We have time for social media. We have time for parties. We have time to go to discos. We have time to go for picnics, holidays and all the stuff. We have a lot of time to do. But Jesus spent most of his time having fellowship with his father. And that's why I will warn the church because we are in the end days. Do not underestimate the devil. Like many people underestimate him. One way or the other he will try to get you my brother, my sister. Because the Bible says clearly that the accuser of brother went to make war with the woman and her offspring. And who is the woman in the book of Revelation is the church. Who is the church? We are the church. It's not the building. My brother and sister in Christ. And that's why the Bible says when the men slept is that's when the enemy came and sowed his way in the same field where wheat was growing. A brother and sister in Christ. That's where some people, even in the storm, they sleep in the tempest like Jonah. You know, Jonah was traveling in a thing, he was running away from the presence of God. The word of God says in Jonah 1 5 that God created a tempest and the uh, the ship or the boat or whatever it was rocking and the people they started to call upon the gods the bible clearly says hallelujah you see clearly then the mariners went afraid and cried every man unto his god and cast forth the waves that they were in the ship into the sea so that the ship will be lightened but jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship and he lay and was fast asleep my brother and sister in Christ, there are two people who slept. One was Jonah and one was also Jesus. When he was tired, he slept. But there is a difference in both of them. When Jonah slept, what happened? You know, there was a tempest and they were afraid. The mariner, the Bible says clearly. And I think if you are a mariner, that you will always know how to swim. So that should not be a problem. But still they were afraid. They had panic in their heart. But Jonah was sleeping unless they had to wake him up. He said, you sleeper, get up and pray. Even the disciples of Jesus Christ were sleeping in the garden of Gethsemane. You know that we all know because if we read the gospels, we know that. And Jesus had to go and wake them up. And finally, Jesus said something. What he said? The flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. My brother and sister in Christ. So the same thing happened in Jesus. He was sleeping. And they also woke up the master and said, Do you not concern over us that we must perish? But the difference is that Jesus had a very powerful prayer life 
and Jesus knew that he was in control of everything that was created by him. Hallelujah. At the command of Jesus, everything has to bow, including the storm, including the earthquake, including the fire, including anything has to bow and Jesus knew he was in control. That's why it did not bother him. He was sleeping. But whereas, because the disciples, they were not praying enough, they started to panic. And that's what happened exactly to the body of Christ. So finally, they had to wake up Jesus and he says, where is your faith? And in a word, he rebuked the storm and the storm calmed down. We know, Bible, that's what Bible says clearly, my brother and sister in Christ. Because they never prayed. So today, the Lord is asking each one of you, what is your prayer life? How many hours are you spending with God? Or are you spending with the world trying to earn money? Examine yourself, my brother, my sister in Christ today. The Lord wants the church to pray. The Lord wants the church to pray. Today we listen to the powerful testimony of a brother. If he was not praying and if a brother was not interceding and praying, today I don't think he would have been alive. It is a prayer that delivers the people. Even Jesus Christ prayed for Peter. Bible says, I'm not telling. Luke 22, or 31 and 32, let's see that. The Gospel of Luke 22, 31 and 32. Let's see what Jesus is telling to Peter. Luke 22, verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may shift you as wheat. Next verse. But I prayed for thee, that thy fail not, and when thy thought strengthened thy brother. Yes, Jesus Christ was praying for Peter, because the disciples forgot to pray. They never had a prayerful life, because they knew one thing, that Jesus always prayed for them. And it's true. Jesus went at different times of the hour and prayed. In Mark chapter 135, the Bible says, early before dawn. He went to the mountain and prayed. Mark 135 clearly says that. Early before dawn, in the morning rising up a great while before the day, he went and he departed into a solitary place and he prayed early before dawn. Let's look at the second time Jesus prayed. Gospel of Matthew 14 verse 23. Let's look into this. Gospel of Matthew chapter 14 and verse 23. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into the mountain apart to pray. And when evening has come, he was there. The first time he prayed was early morning. The second time he prayed was evening. Gospel of Luke chapter 6 verse 12. Let's see. Gospel of Luke chapter 6 and verse 12. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into the mountain to pray. And he continued all night in prayer to God. Now, how many hours are you praying? Not only that. These are the three which are mentioned about Jesus Christ. There is another verse which shows Luke chapter 5, 16. That is the prayer life of our Jesus. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 5, verse 16. And he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. In the other verse, he says, he often withdrew himself. He often, he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. Hallelujah, my brother and sister in Christ. Hallelujah. And that's what God wants the church to pray. God wants the church to come on the knees. Without you being on the knees, there is no revival. My brother and sister in Christ, Jesus Christ was a man of prayer. He often Whenever he got time, whenever he got time, he prayed, he prayed, he prayed. Until today, he is also praying. According to Hebrew life 7 verse 25, he says, he is interceding for the church in which he has purchased with his blood. Sometimes when you don't have time to pray, Jesus is praying on your behalf. My brother and sister, he prayed for the disciples till today, he is praying for the church. My brother and sister in Christ, because you have backslidden in your faith. You have gone back into the world. That's why I will always say that you need to be a man or a woman of prayer. Because through prayer you can win every spiritual battle. One thing the church needs to be understanding, they need to understand 
that we are not fighting a physical battle. That you need to understand, my brother and sister in Christ. We are fighting a spiritual battle. We are fighting the enemy who cannot be seen with the naked eyes. And because he cannot see, you cannot tell that he is not there. He is there. He fights against the church. That's what Ephesians says. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but principalities, powers and rulers of wickedness in this earth. So every minute and every second of our life, we are in a battle and we must fight. Even when the Lord was leading them into the promised land, he said, I will lead you little by little, but the enemy are there, but you have to fight. Because while you are fighting, God is there with you. He is also fighting along with you. He is your commander who is in charge of the army, my brother and sister in Christ. That's why you must be a prayer warrior. I am telling you, there is not a person who prayed and said that God has not delivered him. And that's where the Holy Spirit has been given to the body of Christ. So that we pray. There will be a time during the time of Esther when Haman wanted to kill the Jews. Bible says clearly. Look at Esther chapter 4 verse 7. This Esther, she was taken from a slave girl of Susa. And by the grace of God, she became the queen during that time. But she was living a very comfortable life. You know that once you become a queen and all, you live very comfortable. Everything is at your service. You get the best of hospitality, the best of service. Every, you know, everyone are there by your side. You just ring a bell, people come and this. Esther was very comfortable with a new position. Like see, sometimes when you become the prime minister or you become a minister, you are very comfortable with a new position. Okay? So this Esther was comfortable. But behind the scene, what is happening? Morkadai was at the gate praying because he knew that the enemy was already in Jerusalem. Today we think that the enemy is on the road. No! The enemy is already in the church. So here Morkadai see and told all that has happened unto him and the sum of money that Haman has promised to pay to the king's treasury for the Jews to destroy them. He wanted to wipe away the Jews in which God has made a covenant. He made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And here we see that the enemy, Haman, wants to wipe out the entire Jewish nation. Because that's when Morkadai, he said, it's my time to go and put my foot in the palace. You know why? Because Esther was there in the palace, my brother and sister in Christ. Hallelujah. Let's look in verse 16 what he says to us. See, he, he comes and he tells her clearly what he says, really, go gather together all the Jews that are present. That's what she's telling. He said that the enemy is coming to kill you, to destroy you, this wicked Amman. But don't think you will be spared before because you are the queen. Because your identity will be known. You and your father's house will perish in verse 12 and 13. He says that if you look into 12 and 13, he is telling her, he is reminding her. That's why we must always uh, remind from where we have come. And they told to Morkada Esther, then Morkada command to answer Esther, think of not yourself for thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. Verse, the next verse, 13. Okay. For if thou also hold thy peace at this time, there shall be enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knows that thou hast come to the kingdom for such a time like this. So don't think Queen Esther you will be comfortable. Because not only did Haman target uh, the Jews, but he has also targeted you and your position. So immediately this woman, she feared God, but maybe her prayer life was not that much. Because she was enjoying everything. In the palace. You know when God gives everything to you. Your prayer life becomes down. And that's why sometimes he will put trials. He will put tribulation. He will put prosecution. He will put all these problems. So that you come back to him. Because you have gone very far away. And he knows that if I put this infirmity. If I put this problem in you. That you will come back and call upon his name. Because you will try all your level best to do. Whatever your hand can possess. 
But finally, you will decide and say, let me go to God. And he wants you, and you will come, he knows you will come back. So what happened in verse 16, clearly, Esther shook up from her sleep. Because she was very comfortable. Go gather together all the Jews and present his Ushan. And fast for me, neither eat nor drink three days or night, for I also and my maidens. Fast likewise, and so will I go on to the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. Because according to the Jewish law during the time of Esther, no one can enter into the king's chamber without him inviting you. And that invitation was unless he lays his hand on the scepter. Is thus when whatever wish you have will be granted. So faster, she had to find favor not with the husband or an earthly king. She had to find favor with God. And that's why she fasted and she prayed. That's what happened, my brother, my sister. When you fast and pray, God will deliver you from such a type of situation. And we know that when she fasted and prayed, favor was given in the hand of the king. Why? Because the Bible says the heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord. He turned it and immediately favor was granted. Immediately the identity of Haman was known. Of what he wanted, not only to kill the Jews, he wanted to kill Morkadai. He also he prepared, a, you know, a gallons. Or a, you know, with the, he wanted to hang Morkadai, and immediately we know the enemy was killed and defeated. My brother and sister in Christ. The same situation came even during the time of Jesus' disciples. There was a person who brought his son. You know, he was a paralytic person. He always uh, often uh, jumped into the fire or into the water. He was mentally retarded, I can say clearly. He had LFC, which is one of the mental disorder. So the person brought his son to Jesus, to Jesus' servants, to Jesus' apostles, to Jesus' disciples. But they could not do anything. They could not do anything. They could not cast out the demon of infirmity. But let's look at the same disciples, okay? In Luke chapter 10, verse 17, see what are they saying to Jesus. In the gospel of Luke chapter 10, verse 70, and the 70 returned again with joy saying, Lord, even the disciples are subjected unto us through thy name. So if the demons were subjected to them, then why are they having problem with this demon? Because in the demonology or in demons, there are certain ranks. In a spiritual warfare, there are ranks. You know? So this demon was a higher rank. And this demon said, not to buy you, just say the word, name in the name of Jesus, I will go. No. This demon wanted fasting and prayer. Because the same thing happened. He came to, he came to Jesus. Jesus was told him, why are you coming to me? Why did you not go to my disciples? You know, I have given them power and, and you know, see how they are casting out demons and they are rejoicing and they say that even the demons are subjected, you should have gone. You know what he says, I tried, but your, demon, your disciples, they didn't know why, because this demon was stubborn. And this demon refused to go. And Jesus in a single word casted out the demon. And immediately, they were disturbed, I can say, they didn't like it. You know, maybe the ego must have hit them. Jesus given us power and authority and what this demon and we could not and he just and they said he said why we could not cast it out they wanted to know he said this demon comes by fasting and prayer that's way in when you are into the ministry of deliverance you must fast and pray not that because you have power and authority that every demon the yeah, demons may come out depending on the ranking of the demon and the authority, I said they are rulers of this world. Because once upon a time, the same demon, they were there in heaven. And they were given power and authority by God. Until Satan was able to convince them so that they rebelled against God. But they never lost the power and the authority when on this planet earth. So this demon was a very hard strong, I can say headstrong demon. He said, I will not go. Because that demon wanted the person to fast and pray. They were not fasting and praying because why? Jesus was providing for them everything. That's what I told them in the garden of Gethsemane. They were sleeping. They were eating. They were getting everything. So why pray? 
Wife, bro. Today I got very good job. I have a house. I have nice car. I am settled in this country. Why pray? The same thing they did. And they knew that Jesus always prayed. They noticed that every minute whenever Jesus got time, he withdrew from them and he prayed. So they never bothered. What should I care? My master is there. You see clearly. But there was a situation when Jesus said, my time is over on this planet earth. I am going back to my father. But till then, you know, they were enjoying life at its best. They know, even if you don't pray, no problem. Jesus is there, he will pray. Even if you can't cast out the demon, they come to Jesus. Jesus will do that. He will heal the sick. He will raise the dead. He will cure the lepers. So we don't have to bother because he's there. That's what many people. I don't have to pray. My pastor is there. He will pray for me. My pastor is there. He will pray for me. My bishop is there. He will pray for me. But you live according to the world. Okay? You don't pray. You live according to the world. Anything, what's your what problem? My pastor is there. So the disciples also played the same game. What they said? Oh, I don't have to worry. Jesus is there. He will pray for me. And Jesus did pray. Because Jesus is telling Simon, Satan wanted to shift you. But I prayed that you may not lose your faith. Go and strengthen your brother. And why Peter was a target? Because Peter had to become the pillar of the church. The revelation in Matthew chapter 16 and 16 was given to Peter, not to any other. He asked Peter, who do you say I am? Some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist, some say Jeremiah. But he says, who do you say, Simon, son of Bajor? He says, you are Jesus, the son of the living God. And Jesus gave a powerful revelation. And that's how Peter became the pillar. He said, flesh and blood has not revealed, but in the spirit of my father. And upon this rock, I will build. And who is the rock? The name Peter means rock. I will build my church and the gates of heaven of hell shall not prevail over it. And what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you lose on earth shall be lost. That power and authority was given to Peter because he had to be the next Moses of the New Testament. You see clearly? The Moses of the Old Testament was different from the Moses of the New Testament was Peter because he had to be the leader to lead the church. God had a very great plan and a purpose and the devil wants to terminate this fellow. Peter. So if you have a great plan and a purpose on your life, if you have a great calling upon your life, I will tell you the level, the devil will try his level best to kill you or to destroy you, to abort your vision or your dream or your calling. Be careful. Be careful. I'm telling you, my brother, my sister in Christ. He tried it with Peter. He will try it with you. If you believe that you are being called with a special calling from God, you must be very careful with that. Because he did not stop there. Because the first time, Jesus is praying for Peter. Again he tried the same trick. Through who? Through Herod. We see in Acts chapter 12. He was able to kill who? James. He was successful. Herod was successful. By killing James. And next day morning, he wanted to kill Peter. Again he came back of Peter. In Acts 12, 5. But this time, you know what happened? The church that was sleeping, it woke up. Hallelujah. In verse 5. Then Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing for the church unto God. And when they started to pray, you know what happened? God sent his angels and delivered Peter from prison. That is a physical prison. But today, my brother and sister, there is a spiritual prison. That's why today we see many people they are into bondages. Many people they are into slavery. Many people we see they are into drugs, into alcohol, into fornication, into adultery, into idolatry, into all type of stuff. They are bound spiritually. Unless you pray, God will not deliver the nation. That's why he said in 2 Chronicles 7.14, If my people 
who are called by my name will humble themselves, will seek and pray and turn away from the iniquities of wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal the land. If my people who are called by my name, you and I, we all are called by the name of God, my brother and sister in Christ. And in the book of Genesis 4.26, they started to call upon the name of God. On the book of Genesis, it says, 4.26, they started to call upon the name of God. Hallelujah. You see clearly, I am said to him, also, there was born a son and he called his name Enosh. They began, and men began to call upon the name of God. They started to call upon God. And today, God wants you and I want to call upon him. Because Psalm 50 verse 15 says, Call to me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you that you may glorify me. Hallelujah. And that's why we call him. In Psalm 50 verse 15 says that. You see, call to me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee. He says, call to me. He is not telling go and call your friend or go and call the doctor or go and call the nurse. Hallelujah! Because anything before it is manifested in the physical gets manifested in the spiritual. But the problem is the devil always makes the church ignorant of spiritual things. Even the disciples of Jesus Christ, they could not understand the teachings of Jesus because according to the standard, the level was high. And they were not able to take it. My brother and sister in Christ. And that's what we need to understand. We are fighting an enemy. And that's why he says, call to me in the day of trouble. Call to God. Look upon God. There was a king called Asa. In the book of Chronicles, the Lord blessed him. Gave him everything. But the Bible says that, you know, when he became mad, he went and sought the physicians and not God. This person who God blessed him, lifted him as the king, King Asa. The saddest thing that he went and he consulted the physician and he died of the sickness. My brother and sister, today I am asking you, are you calling upon the name of God? Call upon the name of God while he is near. Isaiah 55 verse 6 says clearly, let's look at that. Isaiah 55 and verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. And where is God? God is inside you through the Holy Spirit. My brother and sister, God is not far somewhere. God is not in that country and is not in this country. No, God is present everywhere. He is omnipotent, omnipresent and omniscient. That is the attributes and the qualities of God. But the devil or Satan is not omnipresent. Devil is not omnipresent. Devil is not omniscient. Devil is not omnipotent. You need to understand that. And that's where you need to educate yourself with the word of God. You had enough of education of this world. But you not need to have education from the Holy Spirit, my brother and teacher. He will teach you things concerning me. That's what Jesus Christ said to the disciples. He will teach you. That's why they were very effective in the ministry, the disciples. They never went to Bible school. They never studied degree in theology. I studied. But I will never say that the theology can save a soul. No! It is the spirit that gives life Amen. for the flesh. Prophets nothing. Hallelujah. That's what Jesus said. They were people of the spirit. They shook Jerusalem up and down. The word of the Lord prevailed in a city called Ephesus. Through these ordinary people who had no form of education. You see clearly, but God used them. You know, because they learned under Jesus for 40 days. 40 days of training was ready to impact the entire Israel, I can say, my brother and sister in Christ. That is the power of the Holy Spirit. That is the power of the inner man which God has given each one of us, my brother and sister in Christ. And that's where the Holy Spirit will teach you. 
Jesus himself said, he will teach you what to do, what not to do. He will tell you, he will lead you. That's why you must be a man and a woman of prayer. You must fast and pray. But when you fast and pray, you must be led by the Spirit of God. I will tell you today, it's a very powerful weapon. And Jesus Christ has taught the church or the disciples to pray according to the book of Matthew 6, verse 9 to 14. What? We all know that. So, Lord, pray, our Father in heaven and all that. Let me tell you a, a small testimony which happened behind this. There was a witch doctor. It happened in India. It's a true incident. It's not a false. It's not a fairy tale. You know, it is really happened. And opposite the witch doctor's house, there was a boy who always played on the road. And one day the witch doctor was very angry and he says, you come and play in front of my road. He says, within 10 days I will kill you because you do not know who you are. All the people in the village, they feared the witch doctor. So this boy also feared. So immediately what he went, he went to church and he spoke to the pastor. He says, pastor, he's a small boy, maybe 12, 13 years or something like that. He said, pastor, let this, there's one witch doctor who lives near my house. And he gave me time in 10 days that he is going to kill me. I have fear and I do not want to die. So immediately the pastor asked him, do you know to pray? He said, no, I do not know to pray because how I know to, I am still a young boy, I do not know. The pastor then, but what you know, you must be knowing something, he said. Yes, I know one prayer, he said. And he said, the prayer which is in Mark, in Matthew 6, 9, 4 till 14, our father in heaven, I know that, he said. Okay, you just pray that one pray, enough, and God's protection will be upon you. So this fear came upon this boy because of what the witch doctor said, and he is counting the days. You know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And now this day he has said, now suppose if really he kills me, what is going to happen? So that night he never slept because he can't sleep. You know, because any moment he is going to die. If suppose the doctor comes and tells you, you know, you are going to die in two days, so how will you be? Will you eat? Will you sleep? No! Because, you know, we are human beings, okay? So, immediately, that whole night, this boy was on his knees praying, that one prayer, repeating, 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 repeating. And next day morning, early hours, he slept because he was tired. And next day morning, there was a huge crowd in front of his house. And he thought, what happened? Huge crowd and all. And suddenly when he just went inside and saw the same witch doctor which challenged him was dead on the road with mouth, you know, blood was bleeding from his mouth and he died. Hallelujah. My brother and sister, what we understand by that, prayer is a very powerful weapon. Whatever you know, is that's what you can give. Hallelujah. And that's why the disciples asked Jesus something, teach us how to pray. They just said, teach us how to heal the sick. Teach us how to cast out demons. Teach us how to raise the dead. Teach us how to cure the lepers. They did not ask that. They asked only one question. Teach us how to pray. Because they noticed something. That behind all this what happened. Prayer was the main weapon of destroying the work of the devil. So he taught them to pray. But they were not praying enough. I said because you know they believed that Jesus is there to you know, pray for them. But after Jesus resurrected, they took it serious. Because Jesus says, see, I have finished the work in which my father has sent me. Now I am going back with you. But there is a Holy Spirit which will be sent as a comfort, as a helper. He will come and he will teach you to pray. Now they never had experience of this Holy Spirit. They had experience with Jesus. Like say, I may have experience with you. Depending on how many years I know you. I know you. Because, you know, we lived together, we talked together, we went together, we did things together. But now this person I do not know. But we really thank God for the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit also has the same attributes of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah! For 10 days he taught them to pray. And after 10 days on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell upon them. And the Spirit gave them utterance, my brother and sister. 
their life was totally changed. Their life was totally transformed. Wherever they went, they took the power of God. Great signs, wonders and miracles. After the prayer, Peter is preaching the first sermon, 3,000 souls adding. The second sermon, 5,000 souls have He's going there. One person is begging for, you know, arms. He says, gold and silver. You know, get up in the name of Jesus. He got up. That's what they did. The power of God was all upon the apostles. What was the main factor of the power was prayer. Bible says that even in the shadow of Peter, they brought the sick and they brought those who were possessed with evil spirits. Ordinary people. Ordinary people. I will always say something. God uses the ordinary to do the extraordinary. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God uses ordinary people. God uses the person who has a humble, broken and contrite spirit in who I am looking at. That's what Isaiah 57, 15 he says, for the Lord, the high one and the lofty one. 57 verse 15. He says, I dwell with the person who has a humble, broken and contrite spirit. For thus say the high and the lofty one, the inhabit eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy places, with whom I have the contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of humble and to revive the hearts of the contrite one. God dwells with the humble. That's why when you pray, there must be humility. Not be like the Pharisee who went to pray with the tax collector. Jesus said that parable in Gospel of Luke chapter 18, verse 10 to 14. There are two people who went to pray the temple. Hallelujah. Let's look at what it says. Luke 18, verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not like other men. You see, he is justifying himself. Actronar, unjust, adulterers, or oh, even as this publican. Hallelujah. Other words, it actually says tax collector. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all I possess. Uh, and the publican, standing far off, would not lift up so much as his eyes up to heaven, was both upon his breast saying, God, be merciful to me. I am a sinner. Next verse. I tell you that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other for even that exalt himself shall be abased and he who humbles himself shall be exalted. And that's what Peter said in 1 Peter 5 verse 6. He said, humble yourself under the mighty hand of the Lord. In the day I will exalt you because God dwells with a humble, broken and contrite spirit. If today you have pride inside you, take away your pride. Because with pride you cannot go and pray, nothing will work out. That's why you must allow God to break you. Allow God to melt you. Allow God to mold you. Allow God to fill you. Let him have his way in your life rather than you having your way in your life. It's not going to work. So God looks for a humble person. And God answered that prayer. The disciples prayed. What happened? They saw results. Now today I am asking you a question. Are you praying? Are you seeing results? You must see results. If you say, if you are praying from your heart, you must see results. But if you are not seeing results, there is a problem. What is the problem? Let me explain today. That's what the Spirit of the Lord says. In Psalm 66 verse 18, see what David is saying. Psalm 66 and verse 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. No matter how many hours you pray. But if there is sin in your heart, your prayer is not even crossing the roof. Your worship is not crossing the roof. David was a man of play. Psalm 55, 70 says, three times a day he prayed. But when he sinned against God by committing adultery, he was a worshipper. He was a man of God's heart. He was a man of God's choice. God made a covenant with David. But his worship went nowhere. His prayer went nowhere. Why? Because there was sin in the heart of David. David did not realize. If David realized, why will God send Nathan the prophet? Tell me. Like say, today we are blessed. 
because the holy spirit convicts you once you sin against god but during that time there was no convicting of the holy spirit because the holy spirit was not inside it was above that's why the bible says that when the spirit of god came upon david he danced when they were bringing the ark of the covenant to jerusalem and it left that's what even happened to solomon when he prayed the glory of god came he witnessed the shekinah glory but down the road what he is doing no he fell in love with his wife who turned away his heart in following god so david was a prayer warrior david was a worshipper david was god's choice and david god made a covenant and said to david i will not alter my words no will i lie to david that was the relationship david had with god but sin was inside his heart so god had to send nathan the prophet he told him a parable of a rich man a rich traveler came and this rich man was a traveler came to the rich man's house instead of taking one of his flock he went and took the goat or a lamb that grew in the house of this poor man and he looked after him like a daughter and he brought that and he cooked and gave it and david was angry he said who can be such a wicked and evil fellow in my kingdom when i am there he said don't get excited too much david it is you if you wanted more woman will god not give you you would have given you because david had many wives david did not have one wife he had many wives so in those days i will always say god allowed polygamy polygamy you understand that means you can have many by solomon had 700 wives abraham after the death of sarah he had concubines you know bible says that i am not telling anything god allowed so, so god was not a problem with wives he said david if you still think that you know you still need wives uh, i will give you but what you did uh, you committed adultery with another man's wife and so wicked you are that even you got the husband to you know kill him to cover up your sin so immediately judgment is at your door that's all he said the revelation and he walked away you know those days prophet they did not stay and say make me a cup of tea make me some food Oh, wait you know when you'll give me an offering take it and go no 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 those days prophets they told and they walked away you could not bribe them but today you can bribe them you can bribe the prophet and the prophet also will tell if you give this money then only i will pray there was a sister i was there one of the meeting and this prophet was from ghana and this sister was very desperate she was going through a lot i know she was prophet can you please come oh you know i am tired my sister tomorrow bring an olive oil bottle and bring 200 pounds and i'll come and i'll pray for you that god will deliver you she said that she was very angry because that person she was really going through hell i can tell you many challenges in her life she was so annoyed she came to me and said pastor you know this prophet what is telling us what is he telling he is telling come tomorrow bring an olive oil bottle and bring 200 pounds in the envelope i will pray for you and god will deliver you that's what is the day but those prophets they said they never cared who was there ruling them they walked away and immediately you know what happened david also feared god the quality which was david was he was quick to repent he was quick he never said ah oh the who it who it i'll do whatever i like he never said that like many people you know when uh, someone tells you a problem or something ah who the hell who is he to tell me ha huh? is he righteous is he good or what i do whatever i care when you do that you know what in your arrogance you know you bear the consequences but david was quick to repent he said i had to come back to the cross i had to reconcile with god and i have to make myself right with god i'm telling you one thing my brother my sister whether you are right with people or doesn't matter but make yourself right with god amen because judgment will be at the door post so immediately what he did he repented He said, "Lord, I was brought forth in the womb of my mother." Psalm 51 was written during that time. He cried so much. He says, "Do not take away your Holy Spirit. Cast now your presence. Restore unto me the joy of the salvation and renew our steadfast spirit." He said, "Do not take away. Do not take away your Holy Spirit from me." He knew the importance of the Holy Spirit. He knew that you grieve the Holy Spirit. 
the holy spirit will leave you the holy spirit is the gentleman you can feel the presence of god you can feel the anointing of god you can see god god appears in many forms in a light you see many times you can uh, you see the god do his things but when you grieve the spirit of god the spirit of god is a gentleman he does not tell you he leaves you it happened with king saul he saw it with his eyes that the holy spirit left him and a distressing spirit to cover his life he saw that's why you know he was called to the palace to play the harp and when he played what happened king saul was delivered that means an anointed worshipper worships god in spirit and truth and when his heart is right with god he don't have even to lay his hand to pray on the public they get delivered they get healed every and miracles happen he was that he carried that david carried the presence of god and he also knew that when king saul disobeyed god what god removed he removed the holy spirit and a distress even now he didn't want that to happen in his life is that way in psalm 51 he tell it in verse 10 and 11 what he says clearly do not take away your holy spirit from me hallelujah cast me not away from the presence and take not the holy spirit from me there is a very powerful song composed on this verse by keith green you know a very powerful song has been this thing like you know composed on this verses and we see clearly that what happened he reconciled himself with god and the presence of god came back Amen. to david hallelujah my brother and sister in christ do not ever grieve the spirit of god hallelujah. hallelujah and that's why it is very much important that you need to have a very powerful prayer way elijah was a man who was like us bible says James 5:17 before i finish James 5 or 17 let's see what the word of god says about this man called elijah elias was a man subjected to like our passions as we are and he prayed earnestly that it may not rain and it rained not on the earth by the space of 3 years and 6 months elijah was a man like us elijah was like you like me he is not telling he is different so never ever think that oh he is different or oh, she is different oh because they are pastors or because they are bishops or because they have a title they are different god does not look at that because god does not show favoritism no partiality no is he a respecter of person hallelujah peter had the problem he said do not call any man uncommon he had because of his jewish background he said don't call any man uncommon you know because he had a problem because he was from the jewish as like today many people have they don't mingle with the gentiles hallelujah but paul when he came he said one thing powerful he said he is not only the god of the jews but he is the god of the gentiles and today you and i have been brought into the covenant by jesus christ dying on the cross of calvary and whatever separation was made uh, jesus reconciled it for you and me on the cross of calvary hallelujah that's what galatians 3:30 is the curse is the person who hangs himself on the tree for jesus himself has redeemed us from the curse so that the blessings of abraham may come upon the gentiles who is the gentile you and i once upon a time we all are idol worshippers we are not jewish people we are not jewish people we are all gentiles but god jesus has given us that access to the spiritual blessing to the physical blessing and to the financial blessing he says the blessing of abraham may come what was the blessing of abraham he says i will bless you and through you the nations shall be blessed that was the promise given to abraham and that blessing today you and i can, can access because jesus said it in galatians 3:13 that when he became a curse so that the blessing of abraham must be given to the gentiles that's why today you are blessed Amen. that's why you are blessed in three areas i will always say spiritually physically and financially many people are best spiritually physically but financially you know there is a problem hallelujah because when god blesses you he blesses you in these three areas 
you must be a blessed i cannot say that you being a christian and you are still in poverty there is something problem go check yourself check yourself if you are still in poverty because word of god does not encourage poverty the blessing of god makes one rich he has no sorrow jesus said i being rich became poor that you poor must become Lord John 2 says, the beloved, I pray for you that you may prosper and that you may be in good health as your soul prosper. So why are they telling all these words? My brother, my sister in Christ, because you are spiritually there, you are physically having good health, but financially, the devil is robbing you. You need deliverance in that area. I am telling you that, my brother, when you know the secret, you will be a rich person. You will be a richer person. I am telling you today. God doesn't want his church to be in poverty. God doesn't want you to be like a beggar. You see many things I see in Facebook. They all beg. It is a very sad thing. Men of God, children of God, they beg. Because they don't know to depend on God. Because God is the one who will make you rich, not me. When you follow the commands of God, when you obey the commands of God, when you give what belongs to God, I am telling you today, you will be rich. You will have a house, you will have cars, you will have everything, you will be having money in your pocket, you will be able to support other ministries. Amen. But today you yourself do not have food for yourself. What are you going to talk about other people and do that? Why? Because there is something wrong with your spiritual life. A brother and sister in Christ and today... God is speaking to everyone. Increase your prayer life. Be a man of prayer. Pray. Do not give up. Pray, pray, pray. In the light will break out. Because after darkness comes light. That's what a brother gave testimony. He saw a bright light of Jesus. Why is that? I am the light of the world. He said in John 9 verse 5. So Jesus appears in our light. It's true. My brother and sister in Christ. Jesus cannot appear in darkness. He can appear only in light. That's where when he prayed, the Bible says that his garment changed the color. It became white. It started to glisten. When? When he prayed. Who prayed? Jesus. They saw the glory at the Mount of Transfiguration. They saw two people coming and ministering to him. One was Moses and one was Elijah. And who are witnessed? Three of the disciples of Jesus witnessed. They saw the garment of Jesus suddenly changing color, becoming white. Glory. They saw the, the glory form of Jesus. They said, what changed that? It was prayer. Amen. So you woman, no need of going to the beauty parlor and uh, doing up yourself. If you pray, your face will shine. Hallelujah. Amen. Like Moses. Hallelujah. Moses had to cover his face. The glory of God was on him. Stephen, Amen. when he was martyred, the Bible says his face was like an angel. Yes or no? Stephen, his face was like a Angel, I am telling. So when you start praying, your face will start glowing, glamour will start coming. People will ask you, oh, what makeup you are using? Which beautician you went? What products are you using? You don't have to say, my product is praying. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Use it. It will work for you. Hallelujah. I believe in that. I believe in that. I don't believe in all doing all that. Even in my marriage, I never went to the beauty parlor. I am telling you. But I can still show you my wedding photos. <laughs> I'm, I'm not lying. I don't have to say something to just make you get excited. I'm not here to excite people. I'm not that type of a preacher. Hallelujah. It will work. The face of Moses was radiant. He had to cover his face with the veil. And when he came into the presence of God, he had to remove it. Look at the woman of God. By looking at the face, you can tell these women are women of prayer. But half of them, they go to the beauty parlor, even before ministering, they go, they want to look beautiful. Because nowadays I've seen in, uh, you know, Instagram, I've seen in Facebook and everything was happening. The wife is more beautiful and more glamorous than even the pastor. So the men are attracted more to the woman than they are attracted to the men. I'm not joking. It's true. You look at any big ministry, you will see. But that is not what God has told us. When you pray... Your face will shine. Amen. Your face will shine like the sun. Amen. You don't have to have makeup. The glow will be on your face. The glow will be upon you men. 
You know clearly that's what the word of God says. That's why prayer must be a part of your life when you walk with God. I tell you only with prayer you can win every battle. And the second thing is you need to have faith in believing. And faith is not what you see. Faith is what you don't see. Brother and sister in Christ. Everywhere where Jesus asks only one question. Where is your faith? Where is your faith? Where is your belief? Oh faithless generation. He said if you have faith as a mustard seed. If you command this mountain to shift and move. It will move. So where is your faith? Where is your faith? That today you are crying. Where is the faith that today you are crying? Once upon a time you are a man of God. Once upon a time you are a woman of God. Once upon a time in India you said, Lord, I will pray till you take me to the United Kingdom. Take me, take me. God answered. Now today I am asking the question, where is that prayer life? Where is that prayer life? Are you praying the same way? Are you praying the same way? Like how you prayed? Yeah, it's prayed. I was brought forth in pain. Extend my territories and my boundaries. He was cursed among his brothers. He was brought in pain. God answered the prayer of Jabez. God shift the atmosphere. John Knox said, if you do not give me Scotland, let me die. God gave Scotland. Revival broke out in Scotland. All these people who do big ministries or who were used powerfully by God in the 70s and the 80s, they were men of prayer. They were women of prayer. And that's how God used them in a mighty way. Because when prayer becomes a part of your life, everything is easy. Hallelujah! When prayer becomes a part of your life, everything in your life becomes easy. Hallelujah! Because there is no place for the devil. And that's where Jesus said, us, watch and pray. Amen. In Luke 21, 36 says, watch and pray. Because the devil is the one who is trying to sow tears in the field of the wheat. Hallelujah. If you don't watch and pray, you will have a lot of problems. In my life, it is there. If one day I don't pray, my life is entirely off. Everything happens away. But one thing, I have learned one thing from the Lord in my walk with God, 23 years of ministry. I am saying one thing I learned, that before leaving my house, I will pray on my knees. And I see the day smooth. Because I know there is always challenges. There is always the devil which is behind you. To kill you, to destroy you. The work of the devil is what? The thief comes to kill, to steal and to destroy. That is the work of the devil. He is not your friend. Don't think the devil is your friend. He can never be your friend. He is always your enemy. God is your friend. Make Jesus your friend. That's why he said, I call you friends. I don't call you servants. He went to the extent in James 2.23. He said, I am a friend of God. Who? Abraham. Hallelujah. I called him alone and I blessed him. For he is my friend. And today, make him your personal friend. Who? Jesus. You can have many friends. I am not telling. But make Jesus your personal friend. Make Jesus your priority. Have fellowship with him. Listen from him. Listen from him. Like Adam, and as long as he was walking with God, he could hear the footsteps of God. He could hear the voice of God. He is your actual friend. He will never leave you, nor will he forsake you. But all the other friends who you believe and trust, they are all fake. That's why today we have fake friends, we have fake accounts also in Facebook. But Jesus Christ is not fake. He is original. Because taste and see that the Lord is... Hallelujah. Let's give glory to God. Hallelujah. Father, we praise you, we worship, we thank you for this hour. Lord, pray. Father, we thank you for this word, Lord. Master, that we are here to edify the body of Christ. Lord, we are here to prepare your people for the coming, Lord. Master, Lord, let them be man and woman of prayer, Lord. Let them pray without ceasing, Father God. Because, you know, prayer produces miracles. Prayer produces healing. Prayer produces deliverance, Father. Lord, let us be on our knees praying for this nation also, Father God. Lord, that they may rule. Because the word of God says the righteousness exalts a nation. 
In Proverbs 14, verse 24, you say, Lord, Father, as we pray for the government, as we pray for those who are in power, Lord, Master, we pray for our families, Lord, we pray for our loved ones, Lord, we pray for our friends, Lord. Father, we pray, Lord, let become pray be a part of our life, Lord. Master, increase the prayer life. Let us spend more time in praising, worshipping and exalting your name, Lord. Lord, let us be a man of prayer. Let us be like Jesus, Lord, who always prayed, Master. Let us pray, Lord. And teach us how to pray as you taught the disciples how to pray. Because the Holy Spirit is there. In Romans 8.26, for you do not know how to pray, when to pray and what to pray. But the Holy Spirit will intercede on behalf of you and will teach you how to pray. Father, let us be a man and woman, Lord. Let the church be built upon prayer, Lord. Let the church be built upon prayer, Lord. Let worship be built upon prayer, Lord. Lord, let evangelism be built upon prayer, Father God. Lord, let anything we do, Lord, let it be built upon prayer, Lord. Even meditating the word of God, let it be upon prayer, Father God. Teach us how to pray, Father God. We know your Holy Spirit is there with each one of us, Lord. We pray that we worship. We thank you once again. Bless your people spiritually, physically and financially. Let them lack nothing, Lord. And let your name be glorified. In the mighty name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who reigns forever and ever. Amen. Let's give a clap offering unto the Lord. Hallelujah.